the last two days we have spoke about we have spoken about the burden of this thing we call life we've been speaking about this in order that you will understand what this burden is or what our problem is and if you truly understand it then you will be able to let go of it toss it away and be free of it now we would like to begin talking about the things on which this burden is established the things on which this problem grows this means that we will be speaking about the benja kanda the benja kanda which means the five groups of clinging or the five aggregates of clinging these are five categories of things which we attach to these five khandas are what make up life the five khandas cover everything that makes up life there is nothing that happens in life which does not somehow involve one of these khandas so when we speak of the five khandas the five groups of clinging we're talking about all aspects every aspect of human life now when we speak about these five khandas and about the various things which are related to them which are associated with the five khandas then we in effect talk about everything that buddhism has to say if we study these five khandas completely fully in every aspect both the khandas and everything involved with them then we will have studied all of buddhism there is nothing in buddhism which isn't in one way or another involved with the five khandas so talking about and studying and investigating and observing the five khandas means that we are studying all aspects of what it means to be a human being something surprising about the five khandas is that it seems that nobody is really interested in them nobody really bothers to pay much attention to them they're not exactly the most entertaining subject there is around it's not a kind of topic that brings out lots of laughs and excitement in listeners even in thailand which is supposed to be a a devout buddhist country nobody really pays much attention to the five khandas or when they do when thais study the khandas they only study it as a kind of ceremony they they say a few chants about them and leave it at that or maybe they've got some books some theoretical explanations of the khandas and then they go and read these books memorize them discuss them maybe even go so far as to argue about it this is about as far as people ever go in studying the khandas they go no farther than a theoretical intellectual level they don't bother to approach the khandas scientifically by scientifically we mean going into these things experientially experimenting with them not with some concept or idea but with the things themselves so to scientifically study experiment with and explore these things as they happen dealing with the real things 
rather than some abstract notions about them. So this is what we propose to do, is to begin to talk about the khandas in a way that will help you to explore them scientifically so that you can experience them and through that experience they will be proved to you what they are and how they are within your own minds. After the Buddha was enlightened, he began to teach. His first sermon was about the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Truth of Tukha, the Noble Truth of the Cause of Tukha, which is craving, the Noble Truth of the Cessation of Tukha, which is the Cessation of Craving, and the Noble Truth of the Path that leads to the Cessation of Tukha. This is what the Buddha taught in his first sermon. In his second sermon, he talked about the five khandas and taught that the five khandas are not self. Let me point out that when we say not self in this context or in any other context, we are not saying no self. We're not going to, there's the one misunderstanding that there is a self, and then there's the opposite misunderstanding that there is no self, which people take to mean there is nothing. These are two opposing misunderstandings. When we say not self, we're taking a middle of the road position saying there is this, but it is not self. So in the second sermon, the Buddha discussed the five khandas and explained that they are impermanent and not self or not soul. The first teaching was about the first, the four noble truths. And then the second one was about these five khandas. And through this teaching of the five khandas, the listeners became enlightened beings or arahans, perfected ones. And this has become the, the Buddha went on and taught this more than anything else. The teaching of the five khandas occurs more often than any other teaching in the Buddhist scriptures. And every time the Buddha is teaching that these five khandas are impermanent and not a soul. The five khandas and the truths that they are impermanent and anatta are a teaching that we can take as the heart of Buddhism. This is the, the core teaching of Buddhism. Even in the Mahayana schools, those are the, the schools that up, appear in the northern parts of Asia, such as China, Japan, Korea, Nepal, Tibet, and parts of India. In these Mahayana schools, where they have developed various teachings which aren't found in the Theravada or Southern tradition, in spite of, even with all these additional teachings which, have, which occur in the Mahayana schools, nonetheless, every sutta or discourse, no matter what topic it's about, about some bodhisattva or this or that, these discourses always end with a reference to the five khandas being impermanent and not soul. So even in the Mahayana tradition, which includes many, many things which we don't find in the Theravada tradition, we find the core central teaching of the five khandas being anatta, not self. And so this, even though these two 
traditions in Buddhism, the Theravada and the Mahayana, often go in completely opposite directions in some of the digressions and explanations and details. There is still this one core teaching that holds both of these traditions together in which is a common ground within all of Buddhism, no matter what school or what, what external forms and ceremonies and rituals it takes on. At the heart of Buddhism, if it's really Buddhism, there is always the teaching of the five khandhas being impermanent and not soul. The five khandhas are the source, or not the source, but the, the basis of our misunderstanding. Through misunderstanding these five khandhas, we take them to be an atta, or the Sanskrit word atman, or English soul, or self. We take these five khandhas to be some sort of soul through misunderstanding them. This was going on long before the Buddha appeared in the world. This misunderstanding and attachment to the khandhas happened and had been happening for a long time before the Buddha. But then the, when the Buddha appeared in the world, he saw that these five khandhas were not, in fact, a self or a soul. Rather, they were anatta, and then he taught this. And so we need to study these and look into them to truly realize this fact that the five khandhas are not soul. Until we realize these facts, these are these khandhas are deceiving us. They're playing tricks on us, conning us into thinking that they are a self, some sort of soul, atta or atman. So don't let them deceive you. Don't let them play their tricks on your mind. Observe them and scrutinize them until you see what they really are. If you can remember the example we gave the other day about the child who kicks the chair out of anger. When the child bumped into the chair and there was the unpleasant sensation of pain in his leg and then anger arose then there arose the, the illusion of atta, the illusion of a soul within the mind of that child. I am an I. I am a, a self. This, this misunderstanding arose in the child's mind. And with that misunderstanding, then there also arose the, the misperception that the chair is also an atta a self, a soul, some permanent, separate, individual entity. This, and so there is the, the atta illusion of I am an I, and then it is my opponent. And so here we have this fundamental conflict arising already. Nobody taught this to the child. It happens in children even before they go to school. This is something that arises instinctually within the minds of sentient beings. So this is how this atta is arising. And this is an example on the physical level, how we take something physical, a body, a chair, to be the soul or self. This is a subject which we need, a topic which we must go into in greater detail in order for you to understand it completely. Yesterday, we mentioned that life is made up of two aspects, nama and rupa, mind and body, 
or sometimes it's translated name and form. Nama in rupa, mind and body, the mental and physical aspects of life. The physical aspect is not very complicated, but the nama aspect is more complex. And so we often divide it into four categories, giving us five categories, body and then four mental aspects. The first mental aspect are, is Vedana, feeling, the feeling group which you ought to understand by now. Then the second is the sanya group, perceptions and discriminations about this is red, that is white, this is tallness, shortness. Then there is the sankara group, the mental conditioning, the thinking and proliferating and emotional aspect of the mind. When I mention emotional aspect of the mind, when I use the word mind, I'm including also what some people would call the heart. And then there is the fourth mental aspect or the fifth khanda, which is vijnana. Vijnana is the awareness of or knowing of the sense stimuli, sights, sounds, smells, and so forth. So we can, we can look at life in these two aspects of mind and body, or in the five aspects of body, feeling, perceptions, thinking, and vijnana, or the bare awareness of sense experience. This is all that life is made up of. Life is merely mind and body, or merely the five Pandas. So please take special entra, interest in these things if you would like to understand what life is made up of. When we study the five khandas, let's begin our study with the fetus, which we all once were in the mother's womb. And the fetus is born as an infant. Let's study the five khandas as they arise in the infant. The young infant begins to receive sense stimuli from the world around it. Here we have then the, the sense organs functioning and the sense objects. This is kaya khanda, the body khanda, or excuse me, rupa khanda. Then there are the vetana arising towards these sensory stimuli and sense experiences. And so we have the vetana khanda, uh, vetana khanda. And then after that, there are perceptions and discriminations about those sense stimuli, the sense objects, in the sense experience. And this is Sanya Khanda. Then there is thinking about what is going on, ideas, opinions, emotions. This is Sankara Khanda. And then involved in all this is the awareness of what is happening and the knowing of what is going on. This is Vijnana Khanda. In the womb, the fetus is compounded or made up of, or there is the body Khanda already present but it is not yet complete, it is not yet fully functioning. But after birth, the body khanda begins to function completely with the functioning of the sense organs. And then there is the 
the sense organs are contacted by the sense objects and then there is vijnana khanda arising when these the sense organs and sense objects come into contact so then there is the vijnana khanda the awareness or knowing of those sense contacts this leads to the arising of vetana khanda the various feelings of the mind po- feeling positive or negative or uncertain about whatever sense experience is occurring and then the thinking sankara khanda that is compounded regarding that experience or excuse me sanya khanda the perceptions of the marks and signs of that experience noting various aspects of the experience and then lastly sankara khanda the thinking about it this is how the five khandas come into being and begin to function fully at sometime soon after birth they incompletely existed even before birth but after birth they begin to work fully and then there are these five khandas doing their thing and this is what we call life these are the five khandas or life of life or we can say that life is the five khandas in the womb the sankara khanda or thinking group of the infant is probably not very complete or hmm? not very complete or perfect and so for this reason it's probably not possible for the infant to think and without this ability to think the concept or feeling of i of self cannot arise so in the womb the in, the fetus probably has no no illusion about an i but after birth there arises various experiences which the infant either likes or dislikes is satisfied with or dissatisfied with and because of these the arising of these vetanas then there is the this becomes the illusion that i am satisfied i like this i dislike that and here we have the arising of the illusion of a soul or an i this is the sankara khanda it begins to function completely sometime after birth and it's rooted in this feeling usually the pleasant feelings towards various sense experience and so in this way the idea of a self is formed this is how the burden of life comes into being through the full functioning of the five khandas the burden of life and all the problems that come with it once the i arises this concept of soul this is followed very soon by selfishness where one does one thinks speaks and acts for one's own sake for the sake of the self rather than for the sake of what is right and correct and thus all our problems all the dangers and harm that takes place in the world starts to spin round and round through the arising of this i so this is the burden of life if you study these five khandas and how they work then you will begin to see how the i how the soul illusion arises and then you will maybe be able to do something about it let's summarize what we've said so far with this life 
are the five khandas and their activity. Life is merely these five khandas and their behavior, their activity, and nothing else. This is all that life is made up of. The rain is telling us to end today's talk, and so we will finish, we will stop today on this note, and we'll continue on a later date.